Our speaker for today is Professor Anand Kapri. Professor Kapri was born in Mumbai, Maharashtra, India in 1980 and studied chemistry at the University of Mumbai and York under Dr. J. S. Fairlamp. He completed his PhD in 2008 under the supervision of Dr. Fairlamp at the University of York, UK, before starting postdoctoral work in the research group of Professor Lutz Ackerman at the George August University Goetingen as an Alexander von Humboldt Fellow. He returned to India in 2010 and was appointed as DST SCRC Fast Track Fellow in 2011 and DST Inspire Faculty at 2012 at the Institute of Chemical Technology, Mumbai, before taking up UGC FRP Assistant Professor position in 2014 at the same institute. He has performed very well in his field of research, publishing more than 90 research publications in various reputed international journals and has four edited books in his name. Professor Kapri has been instrumental in the formation of India's first off-kind scientific consortium, that is the Innovation Sustainability Chemistry Consortium, ISSC, and is currently the founding coordinator. Currently, he has been appointed as the Central Placement Coordinator for ICT Mumbai and looks after the training and placement for all the three campuses of ICT. Professor Anant has received many recognitions for his scientific contributions, as well as extensive administrative and research activities, such as the Fellow of Maharashtra Academy of Sciences, Professor M. M. Sharma Science and Technology Award 2023 by Marathi Vigyan Parishad, among others. Thank you, Professor Kapri, for joining us, and the stage is all yours now. Thank you very much, Dr. Cha and the whole team, Dr. Abhanma, for giving me this opportunity. Um, it's a very unique opportunity. I was just studying that when you are giving a talk in a conference, it's different, but this is kind of on world stage. It is online, and still you can reach many people who probably would not be able to access this type of talks in general cases. So it's definitely my privilege as well to be here, given that opportunity to discuss amongst you some of the work that we have been doing for the last eight to 10 years or so. As the, as the title says, we are very much interested in phosphine ligands. We work with various types of phosphines. And the idea was not to just explore it from academic point of view, but the fact that I work in an institute which is reputed for having a lot of company interactions for us almost eight to nine decades, uh, the science which we have done in the last, uh, you know, 10, five, eight to 10 years has also a flair of the work which we do in collaboration with a variety of companies. But definitely the central theme of the science is all about phosphine, how it can affect the electronics of the metal, how that can be fine-tuned into doing reactions which commonly can be carried out at much lower temperature than what is being expected, what has been done in literature. And also thinking about some type of new reaction mechanisms which might be available as a part of the process that we are doing. Phosphines, as we are already knowing, a lot of work has been done, a lot of beautiful structures, complex structures, a lot of steric hindrance. And the main important point in phosphine is the electron donation of the phosphines. Electron rich or electron donor phosphine has been a, an area of interest for many. And that's because you have these electron donating groups which are near, uh, placed near to the phosphine, and the phosphorus lone pair can be easily donated to us the metal. Now, this has been used in a variety of different reactions and groups such as Bhattwar group, Hartwig group, you have uh, Bella group, then Quangfos, many others, even uh, Gregory Foos group. And many others have contributed effectively into deriving a lot of these electron donor phosphines. These are still open structures, but then there are another class of phosphines which are called as cage phosphines. And the interesting point about cage phosphine is when it comes to the structure of this case phosphine, you can see that it is more constrained. Uh, it is part of a case that the phosphorus has been imbibed into, but you can have more flexibility, the type of uh, electronic factors that you can affect the phosphorus and the donation capacity can be fine tuned as well. And there is more flexibility into the type of substituents which can be added to the backbone. There are several other groups which have also contributed heavily to this area, along with Workaday who has immortalized 
the area of cage phosphines, but you have Savamura as well as even Dalfos, which was published recently by Stradiato, has played an important role in showing the cage phosphine does have a lot of electronic static effects which are useful in catalysis. We also are fascinated in this area and we have done some work in this part. Uh, just to add some details to it, the general aromatic you know, substitution reactions as well as cross-coupling reactions are very well known, especially for RI halides. This has been extensively studied by all these various phosphines. But unfortunately, hetero RI halides has some deficiencies, some limitations that we were able to come across maybe several years back when we started this work around eight, 10 years back. We saw that there were some limitations with regards to the poor reactivity. It was less explored. And then we started asking a question, why that could be a possibility? Maybe it is the temperature conditions, it is the sensitivity of these groups, or whether it's simply that these heteroarenes with the heteroatoms which are present can also be coordinating to the metal and trying to reduce the activity, catalytic activity of those metals as well. It all started with this simple chemistry that we have been doing. As I said, we have been interacting quite a bit with companies. And this was one of the starting points of our journey where Assign Incorporation, one of the US company, came to us with a problem that the nucleoside chemistry, which is something which we are very much interested in, and even now we do a lot of work and contributions to this area. The idea was to develop water soluble catalysts, especially the one which is on the left hand side. This one was generated as a part of a collaboration with Professor Sorano. It is a water soluble PTA base complex. We saw that that first generation catalyst was able to do some reaction, the Suzuki coupling of the type of nucleoside, which are privileged scaffolds, and has been used extensively in the DNA and RNA chemistry. But then the questions which were in front of us is when you carry out the reaction, if we can carry out reaction in water itself as a sole solvent. Now that set the stage because this catalyst, which was derived from a palladium complex, a PTA, that was not very water soluble. And many times when the catalyst was uh, used and then you have to isolate the product, you were seeing that the compound was having some trace of metal which was present, which was not useful from future perspective if we are thinking about commercialization, mainly of the process. So in such a case, the water solubility of ligand was very much important because that was deriving the coordination to the metal and naturally that will help the metal to be more solubilized in the water phase. What we did is a simple reaction. We derived this idea from a chemistry which was done previously by Fritz Kuhn, mainly for anatrocycle carbon chemistry, where he has used simple imidazole, uh, n methyl imidazole, and then you can react it with uh, like such a butane saltone. It opens up, and what you form is the zeta-ionic sulfonates. They're very well water-soluble. They have been used extensively, but from NNC point of view, we tried the same thing with this PTA, which is trias of phosphoadamantine. And then we got this monoalkylated product. Now you could ask the question, why only mono? You can very easily see that most of these nitrogen atoms on their own can be lone pair donors, but they are present very close together, only one carbon atom apart from each other, and also the same thing with this phosphorus. So when you create a very powerful electron withdrawing group, like a quaternary ammonium in this place, what it does is it is definitely going to pull up with the electron density from these heteroatoms and then make it less deficient, uh, less electron rich or the donation capacity, the base basic capacity of your own uh, nitrogen or the phosphorus is lost to a large extent. And we have done some BFT further as well to understand this aspect. What it does is it is a zutionic ligand. It can easily coordinate with, phosphor, with palladium. It is highly water soluble. And now you can carry out the same reaction in water sole solvent, you can isolate the product without column chromatography, and the metal doesn't leach out because it has more affinity for water. So it was very exciting that we were able to address some of the questions by the company, but then we also saw that there was more opportunity for us to try and work out processes which were already going on in company. And in collaboration with Rasayan as well as Sapala Organics, this was one of the main problem which were, we were facing. This is a root linker, which is a precursor used in uh, nucleoside chemistry. And the main idea is you use this molecule for converting into oligonucleotides, and it could be used for sensing of variety of uh, viral DNA. 
So this is a very useful link uh, and generally prepared on large scale. There are two or three problems which are associated. So you have a sugar link, uh, structure and you have this DMT protection. So DMT is a very acidic labile group. You want to trace amount of acid and it falls off very rapidly. So you have to be very careful the type of process you are uh, doing in your laboratory as well as you have to demonstrate on a commercial scale as well. We are able to carry out the reaction and why we are we were successful. One way to understand is when it came to the commercial process which was already going on, 10 mole percent of palladium acetate was used and our job was to reduce the catalyst loading to maximum one or two mole percent. Palladium PTABS combination was able to achieve that. Very high yields were used because at the same time in the case of the commercial process, no more than 50% yield was obtained. But in our case, we are able to consistently get up to around 80-85%. We are able to demonstrate this uh, scale-up reaction not just in our lab to 10 grams, but we also performed the same reaction in the company at 100 grams, and now it's going on much higher scale. But the chemistry is working very well. You can isolate the product without column chromatography using trituration method, and that set the tone for this PTABS chemistry to be explored in further the reactions. We then take it up to another problem. Sorry, I've just gone behind. Uh, we took it up another problem, which was again looked upon more cautiously from the company point of view. This is the carbon um, carboamidation reaction, or carbonylation reaction. These are the products which have a lot of application in industry as well as in academia. And this problem was associated with high pressures of CO, which were commonly used in literature, up to around 100 uh, bar pressure or much higher. Liability of DMT was always there, but the catalyst loading was again, palladium of 5, 10 more, more percent in some cases very high. Limited amines, that means if you want to elaborate on the type of amines, that was something which was missing in the literature. And temperatures were always in excess of 100 degrees, and that is a major problem when it comes to this glycosidic bond, which is highly labile, and at higher temperatures, it breaks down very rapidly. So the reaction temperature had to be curtailed, but at the same time, the pressure and the condition have to be milder. We were able to achieve this in collaboration with Professor Banke, one of the, our head of department in chemistry, and that was also demonstrated in the company Safal Organics. And that suggested that PTABS not just can work in water, that was the requirement, but it can also perform very well on conditions in processes which are also of commercial relevance. That was about nucleoside chemistry, and we were very happy that we were able to contribute to that area. But we started asking a question to ourselves that this was a very niche area, and our contribution definitely will be more limited to that area. So we ventured into a more broader area. This was about heteroarenes, and that's the main area or the, the main theme of the talk that we are I'm going to talk about. When it comes to heteroarene, you can appreciate the fact that when it comes to the structures, these are scaffolds which are present in a variety of drug molecules, agrochemicals, bioactive molecules, and many more. But synthesizing or trying to derivatize these molecules via normal SNAR, which is a substitution nucleophilic aromatic reaction, is not an easy process. And in companies, in many cases, still those reactions have been carried out at 150 or 200 degrees centigrade, which is not feasible because you have various temperature level groups which are present. Idea was to create something which is easier, faster, and something which can be derived from you know, a simple catalytic system easy to work with. So you have to understand, first of all, what has been done in literature. And if you look at aromatic halides undergoing the CO bond formation, especially the etherification reaction, there's a lot of work which has been done, especially from the groups of Aquar, Bella, Gearso, as well as Hartwig, and many more. Even uh, Deva Ma from China has contributed effectively using copper catalysts as well. So your palladium and copper has been used the question which is still remaining is, most of the time, if it comes to aromatic halides, the chemistry is well known. Still, the temperatures have been slightly higher up in 100 degrees, especially for RI fluoride. But when it comes to chlorohydroarenes, there is not much which is there in literature. And only a few examples, especially from the board group, suggest that the reaction temperature is around 60 degrees. Devan Ma also published it, but the temperatures are around 100 to 150 degrees. 
Now the idea was to see whether we can match up with the chemistry which has been happening with respect to chlorohydroborines and try to develop these type of scaffolds very effectively. But the temperature was one aspect, timing of around 12 hours in most cases or higher was something which was concerned. When it came to palladium PTBS, which was what we used, what we were able to observe was after good optimization, the chemistry would work effectively only in one hour. You can have the reaction done at 60 degrees as almost similar to the condition developed by the wall, but the catalyst loading can be reduced. And overall, rather than 12 hours, you can have the reaction done very nicely, very fast within an hour or two. You can derive simple such structures, simple substrates, or you can derivatize a variety of commercially available big and complex structures as well. And you can definitely synthesize similar type of drug molecules which have been talked about in literature. So this was a very positive heartening point for us and understanding that we are able to achieve this chemistry effectively at either similar temperatures as known in literature or sometimes even though now we had to challenge ourselves. And that's, uh, there comes the main challenge. CN bond formation or the upward hearty combination reaction is a benchmark in the you know, in industry. Variety of molecules, not just arene, but hydroarene wise. Variety of drug molecules, agrochemicals have been known in literature, which has a CN bond. And to synthesize this effectively, in some cases, even regioselectively or chemoselectively, is still a very big challenge. Again, huge contributions by the group of Bacall, Organ, Bella, and Ritz have suggested that aromatic halide chemistry for CN bond formation has been very well achieved, even at room temperature. But now it comes to fluorohydroarenes, the question still remains that the temperatures are pretty high and whether there is a possibility that you have some labile groups, which are temperature labile, that type of reactions would then yield poor results or poor products. In such a case, can it be a challenge taken by us to whether we can do the reaction simply at room temperature? Now, if you look at all these conditions, 60, 80, or even if you have 40 or 60, 40, 50 degrees, room temperature is a main challenge because you are not having any kind of activation which will be provided for the catalyst or even the substrate for carrying out the reaction, while SNARs are happening at about 100 degrees. What we are able to achieve with close monitoring and optimization, especially with a group a collaborative group, this was one of the projects we initiated as a part of Humboldt project with Professor Carlos Schuska. And what we are able to see is CN bond formation as per, uh, in case of heteroarenes, can be carried out very effectively at room temperature rather than having again 12 to 15 or 24 hours for the counter reaction uh, timing, we can have reactions done only in four hours, but under very mild conditions. You can have a wide variety of substrates. We can derive a variety of drug molecules as well. One of the molecules which we prepared is a antidiabetic alloglyptin, which has been commercialized by uh, you know, Takeda Pharmaceutical from Japan. And what we see is that there is kind of a state of the art which can be derived if there's thorough optimization of the conditions. In recent times, rather than palladium, other catalysts have also come out very effectively, which has been able to challenge this methodology, but this is still in 2018 and we have further gone on to uh, you know, do some more studies as well and try to come out with better systems. We next looked at another bigger problem Again, CS bond formation as compared to CO and CN, this is a bigger challenge because of the fact that thiols also are known to act as a poison. And this is very well known in hydrogenation chemistry when nickel catalysts are used. So what we observed was if you have alkyl thiols, aryl thiols, aryl thiols are still much better, but alkyl thiols, the chemistry in many of the published procedures, especially from uh, here, so group, what we have seen, even the quad group has published few, that the yields were not up to the mark, not in the higher 80s or 90s. And the reason what was given was probably there is some amount of deactivation of the catalyst because of the coordination of the sulfur. What we are seeing with respect to the palladium PTABS chemistry is there is not much of an effect of sulfur chemistry. We are able to tolerate 
variety of different sulfur compounds, thiols, uh, thiophenols, and we can have a very good yields in most cases. In certain cases, where in, uh, you can see in this case, you can see the yields dropping slightly. But we saw in that case that there was some elemental sulfur which was present as a part of the starting material, and that might be one of the reasons that the catalyst might be interacting with that elemental sulfur. But in most cases, yields are higher up in the 70s, 80s, or even 90s. We were also we were interacting with other companies, and this was one more challenge which came in front of us. So Aether Industries has been one of the names in India, and we have been interacting with them on a slightly different level. The idea was uh, one of the process chemists from Aether. We have this program in ICT where students can do uh, company-sponsored PhD. So as a part of that, there was a challenge which was given to us that if you are carrying out this reaction with palladium, palladium is a very expensive metal. The cost of palladium is very high. You can imagine if you give you a one gram cutlass uh, palladium comparison that goes into several dollars. While in case of that, if you use some out abundant metals, cheaper metals, which are easily available, simply like copper, iron, then you can have very cheap amount of, you know, the cutlass come out is very cheap. It's very well available. And then industry-wise, that becomes a useful catalyst for a variety of reaction, especially CN bond formation reaction. So we accepted the challenge. Um, Uday, who was working as a process chemist, what we discussed was if we are carrying out reaction, especially on the chlorohydrodenes, because there is a lot of importance of these molecules, then we should thoroughly examine the possibility of copper as the possible alternative to palladium. And then use palladium PT like PTBS to see whether you can do the reaction in water. Previously, we were reporting all the reactions being done in DMS, where palladium has not much affinity for water unless and until it is carrying out Suzuki type of coupling reaction. In amination or other reactions, especially HEC reactions, sonic extra, that was not giving good results. However, copper, especially copper acetate when we used, that was coordinating with palladium and PTABS very effectively, but the catalyst was so water soluble. Reactions proceeded effectively, you can say, on water because the substrates are not water soluble as such. But the catalyst was able to work on the interface very effectively. Catalyst was more having affinity for water. And what we are able to demonstrate in most cases, all these examples and many more, almost 50 examples were synthesized by Uday. Because of his process chemistry background as well, he was able to isolate all these compounds majorly without volume. Even these big structures, what you are seeing where you have derivatized some of the major molecules like anti-cancer drugs as well, that can be done effectively without doing volume. And what you are able to show as well, because the water chemical was, water solubility was really good, you can have the recycling of the catalyst done very effectively for a longer period. Now, I have to say something here about the chemistry which is coming up now in recent times in 2023. There have been several papers where Deva Ima has published some fantastic uh, chemistry copper catalyzed amination where these, uh, this type of ligands have been discussed about. However, temperatures have been still in the higher 100 degrees or so. But Bakuad came out with the CO1 formation reaction using this ligand in combination with copper at room temperature, which was published in 2023. And I'm sure that that might also be used for CN bond formation. So there is a lot of interest in copper being looked upon as the possible alternative. I'm not saying it's the main alternative, but it is definitely showing a better reactivity, much more pronounced reactivity as compared to palladium. We now switch ourselves into understanding all the various aspects of what is exactly happening under the conditions, what is the real picture of these ligands, catalysts, what is happening in the solution. So when you look at the ligand, it's very interesting to say that when it comes to PTA, it is still a sigma donor. It has some electron density present on phosphorus. It can donate, so it gets a negative value. This is all done by DFT. But then when it comes to the PTABS and PTPS, you can see even here that there is electron density on the mole of the sulfonates, but the phosphorus is more electron deficient. And it does suggest that it can probably have more accepting power, but it doesn't have the possibility of donating. We have done some more studies as well, where we can uh, we can do a, a phosphorus selenide synthesis in solution. And what you do is, once you have prepared the phosphorus selenide, you can get a phosphorus NMR, 
the selenide peaks, which are generally present as satellite peaks in the phosphorus NMR, you can calculate J value. And what we see is when you calculate with respect to all the various uh, phosphines, which are donor phosphines, they're generally having J values, which are up to 700, which is lower than 800 or lower. That is more of sigma donors. Anything above 700, it starts becoming more pi acceptor or acceptor ligands. What we see is PTFBS is definitely around 820, while the most accepting or almost a pi acceptor, which is your triphenyl phosphide, that shows around 1000. So we are understanding that phosphorus is not much that uh, it is trying to pull away the electron density. It might coordinate and have some amount of electron density pulled from the metal center. But that is something which is a prediction. We further went ahead and looked at other parameters, which are Tolman parameters, to understand how the ligand is behaving. Especially, I want to draw your attention to this uh, ligand size. Cone angle of the ligand uh, with this side arm, which is present, everyone would have thought that it should have a slightly bigger cone angle. But what DFT is thrown up as the idea was it is much smaller. It's around 120 to 130 degrees while even phosphine, triphenyl phosphine is around 150 degrees, 160 degrees. So this is very interesting. And we started thinking that whether there is something to do with the sulfonate, not so far away, but having some interaction with the metal center in close proximity and how that could be possible. So the student was doing some DFT on a super competent BRC with, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Dilip Maiti. And he carried out this, uh, he did it, this, uh, did this video. We have not published anything, this is still a speculation. But what we are is able to see that in solution phase, maybe this is more in gas phase, but in solution, even the sulfonate, uh, alkyl sulfonate is more labile, and whether there is any kind of electrostatic attraction between the sulfonate and maybe the quaternary ammonia, or whether it directly has some kind of interaction with the metal center itself. So we went ahead, we had some more challenges in front of us, and we were interested in uh, incorporating dimethylamine. Now, this is not an easy type of, you know, easy substrate to work with. This is a gas, and dimethylamine has a lot of application. You can see all the various drug molecules which are seen here. So you have to generate this gas, or you can use it, which is a bottled gas. Uh, it is highly reactive, and in some cases, what we were thinking is rather than using this bottle gas and carrying out the reaction, can we activate solvents such as DMF, dimethyl acetamide in solution at very, very ambient temperature, and then carry out the reaction also at ambient temperature rather than very high temperatures, and then access all these compounds effectively in a one-pot procedure. So rather than having this problem of having a you know a gas cylinder, gas and all these various setup issues, can you simply take DMF or DM uh, like DMAC, activated with some uh, base which has been known in literature? Potassium tertiary oxide is used in literature as a base. You can activate it. Dimethylamine forms as a gas in solution. You have the substrates with copper acetate and PTBS. Reaction can be carried out very effectively. And what you get is finally the product, which are not just normal dimethyl amino functionalized products. Some of them are drug molecules, like this one is a drug molecule. But you can also derive this using a deuterated solvent, and you can derive the deuterated version of these drug molecules, which are very costly. There's a lot of importance with respect to the deuterated drugs. There's a big market which is there. But we can easily access these molecules very effectively. We now switch to the understanding of mechanism. It is still in progress, and we are not suggesting that this is the only thing. But what we saw was in case of specifically this mechanism, we were able to confirm that, okay, when you have dimethylphamoboid, you can activate it, potassium tertiary oxide. You can form the amine, which is there. So we have the potassium salt. You can add water. This is small quantity of water you have to add to equivalence. It then liberates that gas. You also form CO. And we were able to confirm by Headspace uh, GC that the SCO is forming. Once you have the amine, it then starts reacting in this condition. Before going ahead with the proposal of the mechanism, what we saw was there was something unusual happening in the reaction mechanism. There's commonly Ullmann type of coupling or Goldberg type of reaction where CX activation using copper as copper zero or copper one is known. But copper two, Activating something is not known because it's generally an electron deficient species as such. It's more Lewis acidic. 
So copper two cannot do that. And what we are seeing is maybe a possibility that copper two might be remaining in the solution for a longer period. However, this is still not a very conclusive answer as such. We are still working on it. We are trying to do the, some DFTs. But we got some I mean, understanding from ESR that maybe in the solution, copper is not getting easily reduced. We had done some experiments with palladium and where also we had seen that palladium doesn't get reduced. Palladium two species with acetates or other groups and the PTA is confirmed even by not just phosphorus NMR, but also by ESIMS. So what we had as a, as a confidence that maybe there is something different happening. And what we see is if you have copper two, maybe it is coordinating more to the heterorene, activating it more like a Lewis acidic interaction, activates the carbon, putting a more positive charge, and then a nucleophilic attack then takes place. You might argue that SNARs are known to happen like that, but SNAR generally happen at high temperatures. This one is not having any activation energy. Temperatures are in the lower temperatures, like 20 degrees, 25 degrees or room temperature. In such a case, the reaction is proceeding very effectively. If you do not use the catalyst, the reaction proceeds to around 10, 20%, which is expected. But in case of the catalytic system, the reaction rapidly accelerates and you get very high reactivity within no time. Even the time is also a very important factor. As in has take almost 24 hours sometimes. We have gone further ahead and what we have seen is this is one more reaction. Uh, we have been doing some thiomethylation reaction. You can again synthesize thiomethyl group methane thiol in solution. You can use this. You can use sodium hydroxide. It activates and releases thiomethyl group or methane thiol. Methane thiol then can be used for formation of this type of products. And what we have done is a sequential reaction, no isolation at all. Fluorohydroarene first converted into thiomethyl. Then you, in the solution itself, you use MCPDA to oxidize, you form the sulfur, and then you then use the same chemistry as what we have done previously to activate this sulfone as a good leaving group where amine as a gas is generated ex situ in a different chamber. And then that will activate and give you this type of amines as well. So you can have to, you can play around with these two different reactive nucleophilic gases and still the overall conditions are so mild and the catalyst is so effective that it doesn't get anywhere uh, deactivated either with the sulfur or the various conditions or the various other functionalities which are present around it. We finally started asking a question that this is all effectively good, but then can we go one step ahead? When it came to regio selectivity, where you have two different CCL bonds, which are effectively similar on a hydroarene structure. So if you see the bond dissociation energies of these two groups, these two CCL bonds, they are almost the same as one kilocal difference, where you could say that this has slightly more advantages as compared to this one, because this is present between two hydroatoms. But that is a very small amount of difference. And what we would suggest in a general SNAR, that you should not have any differentiation or discrimination between two, these two groups at all. And you might still get almost similar 50-50%. Now, when it comes to further ahead, two, four, six, you will see that, that there is absolutely no difference between these two. Now, the question is, if you want only one single activation on the fourth position, whether it's possible that you can have a bias created around the substrate and you can get only one single amination done, and then you can access all these type of drug molecules very effectively. The model, what we are looking at is this, that you can have, a coordination with this substrate, this ligand, which is coordinated, and you can have a steric pulp which is created. Metal is interacting with this heteroatom, which means it is also activating. Positions like these or the fourth position will effectively then be activated. And then you can have reaction happening at regiocentric some specific position. An example can be given for the 2-4. What you see is when it comes to normal SNAR, the reaction simply is not having any bias, almost similar reaction reactivity on two and four. When you have no ligand, still you have some bias for four as what we have seen, one kilocal difference. But when it comes to PTPS with copper, we are seeing almost quantitative conversions to the fourth position. The second position is totally untouched. And we have confirmed by single crystal X-ray for all these substrates. 
This is two, four, but you can have two, four, six. And again, two, four, six, the fourth position is activated. Even the sixth position, which was similar in case of dissociation energy, doesn't, uh, it is not touched because now we have a steric bulk, which is helping it. The nucleophile is not easy to access on this position, but then can be focused only on the fourth. So you can have this, uh, you know, differentiation which you can create and then you can access more useful molecules as such. We recently have done some chemoselective chemistry as well, where you can have very difficult bonds to activate and some which are very labile. So CI versus CF can also be accessed. And in such a case, you can see that in certain cases where you have almost 60 kilocal difference, whether you can activate this under milder conditions, it is possible. But our case, the reaction simply doesn't proceed at all in this position. Reaction happens only in the second position when you have this type of substrates. And we have also confirmed by a single crystal X-ray for all these compounds. Finally, we have come to some more confusions in terms, in terms of what is happening in the solution. This is still not finalized. We are using various techniques as and when they are available. But then we were using in situ IR. This was done in collaboration with BSF, one of the students who is working there. And what we see is we, when you are monitoring the reaction conditions, uh, you know, as, as a dynamic process, we see some changes in the sulfonate group that when you are adding the PTBS on its own, when you have added the copper, and then slowly when the complexation is happening, you see that the solution does have, you know, the, the IR. Uh, region, it does change acetates over a period of time because they are labile. We do see or we do feel that it might be dislodged or this can be uh, dissociated from the copper center while the sulfonate possibly can attack. This try to, we, we will try to understand even the, the cone angle theory, what we had done previously, whether this is like a metallocycle which is forming, but it is very small depending on the size, uh, but it has to be definitely thermodynamically more favorable if that is happening. But what we see is over a period of time, it does show some shift with respect to the sulfonate and the acetates also do fall off and you see acetic acid formation. You can smell acetic acid during the conditions, during the reaction as well. And then you might see such a species thing having a bulkier structure, which is around this hydroarene. And that's why access to this Second position might be slightly less favorable as compared to the fourth, and that was the when uh, that is the reason why we are getting more activity at the fourth position with respect to juicid activity. In recent uh, you know months, we have also collaborated with Professor Bange, and we had done some amidation chemistry earlier, but that PTBS rather than palladium and copper, now we have ventured into rhodium, and hydroformylation reaction has been extensively studied. It has been a um, big area in industry as well. And this was always our uh, interest that we could go into this area where rather than using organic solvent, you can carry out the process in water. And effectively, rhodium with, with catalyst with PTBS is able to effectively do the hydroformylation of the substrate, which is eugenol, and you can get majorly the, uh, you know, the the linear product rather than the branch product, although it is not as effective of PPPTS and we are still doing more optimization to see whether we can improve it. And there will be other derivatives which also be synthesized over a period of time. But we do see that yes, palladium PT, uh, rhodium PTBS is very much effective in catalyzing this reaction. The reactivity is very high as compared to TPPTS. It's just that the linear to branch ratio is something which we are working on. Finally, with a lot of work that we have done and the group which has been working extensively for eight to 10 years, um, the catalyst was recognized, uh, the ligand was recognized. Um, it got the cast number, it was then commercialized with all these various companies. And uh, it also has been uh, incorporated into the encyclopedia of reagents of organic synthesis. Uh, if anyone is interested, we are more than happy to give samples as well. So do message us, uh, whether it's an industry, whether it's academia, because we know that Buying these samples outside is not always easy, but giving a sample is something which we can try. And then if you want to go ahead and buy it, that's a different matter. Uh, in recent times, we also be working on some other chemistry, uh, catalyst, which can 
catalyze the reaction at room temperature, especially for nucleosides. That was our focus because we want to finally come into uh, functionalization of oligonucleotides and DNA at ambient temperature in water as the ultimate goal. And we are very close. We have some results with oligo, but especially for nucleosides, we now have the third generation catalyst, which is called a SIRCAB. And that was recently commercialized with Merck. This has effectiveness in catalyzing reaction, and it is very much adaptable, even with uh, a, you know flow type of setup as well, which we have demonstrated recently. Finally, I have to thank my group. Uh, it's been a long time, you know, almost 2014-15 that we started on this chemistry, and a lot of students have already gone. There are many students who have come in. There have been many collaborators who have been very supportive of our work. A uh, lot of experience that our students have got by going abroad. Humboldt has been very supportive in this case where they have, they have given us opportunity for our students to go to Germany. And most people who have been very you know, kind of giving us even an opportunity for uh, you know, characterization of our compounds, sometimes the x-rays and everything. It has been a very eventful journey for us. We, we have not stopped. We are still doing a lot of work on this. We are looking at a new generation catalyst coming out of this uh, PTABS as well. And we are hopeful that we can challenge other chemistry, other reactions, even photochemistry, photochemical reactions in the uh, uh, recent future as well. I have to thank the uh, you know funding bodies and all the collaborators and everyone who has been supportive. I again would like to thank ACS. This is a great platform. Uh, to reach out to the masses, not just in India or the Southeast Asia, but all over. And if there are any questions, queries, which are there, I'm more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Kapri, for this wonderful lecture.